Bank lending is the growth engine for the global economy. Of course, I don't have to tell you that, but what happens when we see several consecutive bank failures back to back to back? In this case, within six weeks of each other. Well, you have a much bigger problem on your hands when it comes to the economy and the outlook on a recession. And that's what we just witnessed. We saw the third consecutive bank failure in six weeks when First Republic Bank failed, went to FDI receivership, and it, of course is now getting purchased by JP Morgan. First Republic Bank marks, by asset size, the second largest bank failure in United States history. That's pretty substantial, particularly when just two months ago at the March Fed meeting, Jerome Powell said the banking system is sound and resilient. And despite First Republic Bank failing, before this Wednesday's FOMC meeting, Jerome Powell repeated the exact same line, the US banking system is sound and resilient. But today we're here to dispel a little bit of that notion for you. We're gonna talk about how we arrived here, why these regional banks are failing, and why this is a problem of the Fed's own creation. And it could be a solution created by the Fed as well, but with Jerome Powell's immense pride, particularly following his blunder in 2019, he's on a mission to right his wrong, he's on a mission to not pivot, despite all of the financial turmoil that it is causing, and however many regional banks need to die in the process. So we'll talk about all of it and more up next. This video is brought to you by Passport, a sleek and easy to use Bitcoin hardware wallet. Stay tuned to the video to learn more. So the failure of First Republic Bank marks the third failure of a bank in 2023, not just 2023, since the start of March. And in fact, the three bank failures over the last five weeks have eclipsed all of the size of all the bank failures that occurred during 2008. And it's about to eclipse the size of the bank failures during the entire great financial crisis should we continue on this path, which we will. Take a look at this chart right here. You can see Washington Mutual Bank in 2008 and the $94 billion that were lost in the 24 other banks in 2008. And the three bank failures of the last five weeks have already eclipsed the totality of the bank failures during the start of the great financial crisis. What's going on here? Well, a part of it is poor hedging activity, right? Let's be honest. These banks didn't have enough interest rate risk hedges in place. But another component of it is the Fed's own doing. It's hard to argue that the lion's share of the blame here goes to the Federal Reserve and its very wayward determination to murder inflation by way of very aggressive interest rate hikes. It has raised rates by 75 basis point increments, uh, I think seven times in a row last year, which is unprecedented. 50 basis point hikes are very large. 75 basis points get out of town, but that's just what happened, right? The Fed was very late to the party when it came to bringing down inflation, and now it's on a mission to save its reputation by going extremely aggressive in the opposite direction. It was far too easy on inflation at first. And now in order to save it and Jerome Powell, quite frankly, his reputation, they are moving in the opposite direction. So Jerome Powell here, he really has something to prove, right? Remember guys, the Powell pivot, this guy is memed so heavily because of what he did in 2019. He was of course very, very uh, soft when it came to the first sign of trouble in the repo market. He immediately pivoted, stopped QT, resumed QE, and uh, you know began pausing his interest rate hikes. And that's not what he wants to do today, despite the crisis being far worse today than it ever was in 2019. So Let's talk about it. What on earth is going on? Well, First Republic Bank, of course, it fell. By asset size, it's the second largest bank in US history. It's the third regional bank failure over the last two months. Why on earth are regional banks failing? Well, of course, for one, we mentioned the Fed hiked rates way too aggressively and Fed policy works on a lag. So if the Fed raises interest rates last March, which was the first time that it hiked, that policy isn't gonna transmit through until the following year. And, and lo and behold, or roughly the following year, and lo and behold, in March, Silicon Valley Bank, perhaps the most fragile of these institutions because it lent primarily to venture capitalists and tech startups and the deposit base was primarily venture capitalists and tech startups. And so when times got rough for that industry, depositors fled, news broke that SVB was facing some issues. And because bank runs can occur basically instantaneously in the social media era, SVB was out, right? So a portion of it is the fact that the Fed hiked rates way too aggressively and these interest rate sensitive firms, they fall uh, one by one after it. Another component of it is interest rate sensitivity, right? What assets are these banks holding? How sensitive are they to interest rates? Well, in a post 2008 world, obviously prior to 2008, banks were holding still rate sensitive, but very poor quality securities in mortgage backed securities. They were holding garbage, lending against garbage, using it as collateral, basically saying that it was as good as gold. And following 2008, the regulations that the, the Fed and the Treasury 
treasury and all these other uh, regulatory institutions put in place was to have their reserve requirements be composed of treasuries. So banks have been forced to hold a lot of treasuries on their balance sheet. And of course, because they borrow short and lend long, a lot of what they're holding, uh, not just short dated treasuries, but also longer dated treasuries too. And so banks are holding these very long dated interest rate sensitive treasuries on their balance sheet. When rates rise, the value of those securities falls. What did we just say about what the Fed did last year? They raised rates by more aggressively than they have ever done in history. And as a result, <laughs> treasuries, US government bonds, had their worst year in history. Take a look at this chart here. This is government bonds having their worst year in 2022 since 1865, uh, basically in history, right? Let's be honest. You know, if, if you, bonds had their worst year since the Civil War, you'd probably say that bonds have had their worst year of all time, particularly seeing as, you know, US treasuries are much more more integral to global financial markets functioning today than they ever were in 1865. So the interest rate sensitive assets that these banks were holding got crushed last year. Now, this isn't an issue for banks who have a good diverse asset mix of both securities and loans, but for regional banks, many of them have a much larger securities portfolio relative to their loan book. That was the case with Silicon Valley Bank. That was the case with Signature Bank. And in the case of First Republic to a lesser degree, but the reality is these banks have been forced to stomach major losses on these securities that are deemed risk-free. And of course, that is not the case. So let's take a look at this chart here to, to get a sense of the magnitude of the losses within the system. This is the total amount of unrealized losses within amongst the big four United States banks. Those, of course, being JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. And you can see that Bank of America is alone is stomaching one third of this, but US big four banks are holding on to $211.5 billion worth of unrealized losses. That's remarkable, right? When it comes to unrealized losses, they really don't matter unless you have to sell the security, right? You could allow the, the treasury to mature. And of course you get par value back. No harm, no foul. You're totally fine. But in the case of a bank run, you got to sell your securities. You got to call in your loans in order to get enough cash to meet those withdrawal requests. And in the case of all of these banks that have gone belly up, they have had these bank runs occurring within an instant because we live within the social media age and they have to realize these unrealized losses. And when you sell a security that is down 10, 20, sometimes even 30% worth of its value, if you're on the really long end of the treasury curve at the most interest rate sensitive, then you won't have enough cash to meet withdrawal requests, right? And this is where banks failed, regional banks especially, because they have a very small deposit base. And so all of a sudden, you know, if you're seeing bank runs, the banks that have a much smart, smaller, more consolidated deposit base, they run for the hills, right? And this was the case with uh, First Republic. This is why regionals have been so sensitive to this current crisis. Uh, with First Republic Bank, it banked primarily wealthy clients, right? So clients that had more than the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit. When uh, Silicon Valley Bank went under, these deposits depositors dash to withdraw their cash. Obviously, that makes sense. If you're a large wealthy depositor that will only have a quarter million dollars of your wealth secured, and you probably have well more than that, you're going to go to the bank and withdraw it all, right? And so that's what First Republic Bank was faced with. It faced more than $100 billion of withdrawal requests in mid-March, right? So that is obviously extremely huge. And talks have been occurring over the last month and a half or so about First Republic Bank being the next shooter drop, being the next bank that faces issues. This video is brought to you by Passport. This is a very sleek and easy to use Bitcoin hardware wallet. If you've been putting off self-custody of your Bitcoin, which is the responsible thing to do, Look no further, right? Right out of the box, you'll know exactly how to use this. This looks like several devices you've probably used before. It's got a very gorgeous screen, easy to see, and it's got a D-pad, so you'll know how to navigate all the menus and get your Bitcoin off those exchanges very simply and easily. Again, if you've been putting off cold storage for a while, look no further, this is the solution for you. You can visit the bitcoinlayer.com slash foundation and receive $10 off when you use promo code bitcoinlayer. Now, on with the video. Now, just to get a sense of the outflows of banks, this isn't just occurring with, uh, of course, First Republic. This is a system-wide issue. Take a look at this chart here. Over the last two months, since the start of March, money market funds have seen $500 billion worth of inflows. That's where all this money is going. And for regional banks who are very reliant on those deposits in order to survive and who are particularly sensitive to bank runs because all of those deposits can be gone in an instant, you just click a button on your phone, then that's why so many regionals are facing these issues right now, particularly First Republic Bank was a victim of this. Of course, it went into FDIC receivership and all of its assets have been sold to JP Morgan, which turns, of course, JP Morgan into this huge mega conglomerate bank. But the fact of the matter is, this is an issue not just limited to First Republic, but to all regional banks. 
First Republic stock was halted 50 times over the last two trading sessions, and the White House has even discussed a ban on short selling regional bank stocks. That just tells you the severity of the situation that we're faced with. It's not limited to one, it's not limited to two, but there's a real domino effect here of this deleveraging, right? It's an involuntary deleveraging, assets are being uh, defaulted on as deposits fly, uh, banks are forced to call in their loans and, and sell these securities, but they're stomaching these huge losses that are causing these smaller regional banks to go insolvent. PacWest, another example of a bank that is in all likelihood on the brink. The issue here with regional banks isn't going to abate anytime soon unless something happens. And of course, it has to do with interest rates, and I'll talk about it in just a moment. But the issue isn't going away. This is only going to get more severe. Banks are going to continue, uh, you know, uh, going belly up, particularly these smaller regional banks who have these large losses in their portfolio. And this is eventually going to trickle into the real economy. Who's to blame here? Well, I mentioned partially these uh, managers for not placing hedges correctly, but let's be real. The lion's share of the blame goes to the Federal Reserve, the people who are setting and influencing these interest rates and causing all of these major losses on investment securities that they have mandated banks to hold. So the Fed has blood in its hands in two ways. The first way is by raising the federal funds rate even after banks have failed. So the Fed funds rate in the Fed funds market um, is basically the Fed's benchmark interbank lending rate. So if banks need to borrow and lend to one another overnight, uh, the federal funds rate is a rate that is set by the Fed at which they can uh, borrow and lend to each other overnight in the federal funds market. And by setting this rate, it raises all other interest rates, right? They, they set this rate to influence other rates up. And of course, we talk about interest rate sensitivity. So when the Fed hikes rates, those investment securities that are long duration, they fall precipitously in value. So with the Fed hiking uh, the federal funds rate, obviously trying to slow credit creation between banks that'll eventually trickle into the real economy, that's what it's trying to do, right? And we're, we've already seen that. So why on earth is the Fed hiking the Fed funds rate anymore? Well, that's the question that's been asked. And what did Jerome Powell do yesterday? Well, he aggravated the problem by raising that rate again. Right Again, he's allowing his fear of repeating his 2019 pivot uh, of appearing soft right by pivoting um, to run the show. Rather than recognizing the fact that he's causing bank failures, the Fed, uh, of course, is, is, is partly in, in large part to blame for these bank failures. He's ignoring that and he's allowing not necessarily his ego, but I'd say his pride and his fear of repeating what he did to get in the way of the reality that the banking crisis is occurring, right? He hiked Yet again, and despite the turmoil in the banking sector, um, you know he's he's continuing to do this. Eventually, this turmoil is going to trickle through into exactly what the Fed wants. It's going to trickle into lower economic activity because less loans will be extended to consumers, fewer loans will be extended to businesses. But he's still hiked again, right? Credit growth is slowing down in the form of banks failing. But he doesn't care, right? He's still hawkish. He has no signs of stopping. And eventually, he's going to pay in the form of embarrassment when he does have to pivot, right? As more regionals continue failing, when this all comes to a head, you know, he's going to have to eventually move off of his mark that he is holding so ardently right now. The problem is not going away. These mark to market losses on US Treasuries are not going away unless interest rates come down. Duration works in the opposite direction, you guys. When rates are rising, you don't want to touch duration. But when rates are falling, you pile into duration. And for these uh, banks that are holding onto these huge securities, it would really, really help if those securities went up a lot in value. So when they face deposit outflows, they could sell them without fear of going insolvent. Rate cuts would help that, right? Rate cuts would allow those securities to go up in value and it would ameliorate this crisis tomorrow, right? Jerome Powell wants to be like Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker was, of course, in a very, very hawkish Fed chair that that fixed inflation by raising the federal funds rate as soon as it as soon as inflation came and as soon as this inflation came, he lowered the federal funds rate. Jerome Powell is doing it incorrectly. What Paul Volcker did was, as inflation rose, Paul Volcker rose rates. But Powell is late to the party, right? Powell waited several months. He waited for inflation to get to five percent before he did anything about it. Now. Uh, he's trying to be like Paul Volcker, but Paul Volcker, again, he lowered rates when inflation was coming down. That's not what Powell's doing. He's still hiking. So he thinks he's Paul Volcker. He's he's live action role playing as Paul Volcker, but he is not Paul Volcker. He is anything but Paul Volcker, uh, right? So banks aren't failing here. That is the solution. The solution is ultimately lowering interest rates or at least pausing where you are, but Powell is too high and mighty to do it. At the end of the day, right, banks are failing not because they took risks, uh, took too many risks and are paying the price. 
They're failing because you enforced them to hold U.S. Treasuries in the wake of 2008, not Powell, but the Fed. You enforced them to hold this amount of U.S. Treasuries. And because they hold, held those U.S. Treasuries and you went, went on this extremely aggressive tightening campaign, this hiking cycle, they're stomaching major losses that are causing the smaller players to fail. And Powell will do nothing about it. This is his legacy. Jerome Powell, again, he has something to prove. And he is going to continue to allow this crisis to occur because he doesn't want to pivot again. And number two, the other way that the Fed has blood on his hands is by QT, right? So the way that banks extend credit to one another is through bank reserves, right? So bank reserves are very integral to financial plumbing. When they rise, obviously banks extend more credit. When they fall, banks extend less credit. The Fed has been allowing bank reserves to deteriorate off the balance sheets of these financial institutions as it does QT, right? Does quantitative easing, does these open market operations where it buys uh, securities from these banks, and now it's doing QT. It's allowing those securities to mature. But the issue is that small banks are particularly sensitive to when this happens. Take a look at this chart. Um, this is small versus large bank reserves as a percentage of their total assets. In my opinion, this is the most important chart in global finance right now. Take a look at the white line, that's small bank reserves. That is the reserve constraint level where bank regional banks start failing. Now, guys, this is a level that has been hit uh, already in 2019. It was a level that was hit again right when SVB failed. So as the Fed continues QT, this reserve constraint level is going to continue being hit. And so long as it continues getting hit, then regional banks will continue to fail. And the Fed ultimately is going to continue coming in to mop up the mess. Take a look at this chart here. This is of Fed emergency loans. And you can see here when you factor in the loan that was extended to JP Morgan and the FDIC to buy First Republic, more emergency loans are being extended now than they have ever before. In 2008, I believe it was right around 100 billion at the height of emergency loans that were extended by the Fed, but now banks are borrowing more than triple that in order to stay afloat. So they lent out roughly $329 billion in loans last week, which is roughly equivalent to 1.2% of US GDP, which is absolutely remarkable, right? As regional banks continue to die, more and more are going to the Fed's emergency loan facilities. The Fed is continuing to be the lender of last resort. This 2% inflation target that the Fed is ardently striving for comes at the cost of murdering these regional banks, right? The elephant in the room, <laughs> frankly, has quickly turned into a woolly mammoth, right? And the bank funding problem is totally undeniable, right? The Fed isn't supposed to be extending this amount of emergency loans to regional banks, but as they continue failing and the Fed isn't changing its policy to do anything about it, that's what the banks are resorting to, unfortunately. More regionals will die and more cash will have to be lent out by the Fed and the Fed's role as lender of only resort will be made clear yet again. Uh, and one last chart here for you guys, right, is that banks are being concentrated to the top. Whether this is explicit or implicit, whether this is intentional or unintentional, there's a nationalization of banks that is going on, which is extremely scary, right? We've talked about CBDCs a few times before on this channel. The fear factor that is uh, ever present with CBDCs, the central bank digital currency, is that they would have extreme and utmost control over your money and what you do. Well, another way that they can have an extreme control over your money and what you do and over setting interest rates is by making sure that there's no such thing as regional banks. And through its policy, whether intentional or not intentional, it is allowing these regional banks to die on the vine and per be purchased by these much larger banks until there are only a few banks left. And right now, JP Morgan is the Fed's strongest foot soldier. Eventually, it seems if we continue going on this path of allowing these regionals to die, it'll just be Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and JP Morgan. And who's to say some of those banks won't fail in the process and will be left with even fewer banks. So take a look at this graphic one more time. You could see over time, you had several banks competing with one another. You had 10, 20, 30 very large banks in the United States, and now they've all been consolidated into these big four. Right. In 2008, JP Morgan bought Washington Mutual, then it bought Bear Stearns, and now in 2023, it has purchased First Republic Bank. Right. This, of course, this failure of regionals is going to lead to widespread financial contagion if Powell continues sitting in La La Land. And at this point, it's hard to say whether or not a course correction would really do anything about it. Right. Powell's got his head in the sand. A severe credit contraction is at our doorstep as the regional banking destruction proliferates all while Powell sits with his head in the sand. And it seems like more regionals will have to die, more things will have to break before he gets the memo. That's all for today's video. I really appreciate you guys watching. Of course, if you find this content valuable, make sure to subscribe to the Bitcoin Layer YouTube channel to get more of it. We'll talk to you guys later.
This video is brought to you by Passport. This is a very sleek and easy to use Bitcoin hardware wallet. If you've been putting off self custody of your Bitcoin, which is the responsible thing to do, look no further, right? Right out of the box, you'll know exactly how to use this. This looks like several devices you've probably used before. It's got a very gorgeous screen, easy to see, and it's got a D-pad, so you'll know how to navigate all the menus and get your Bitcoin off those exchanges very simply and easily. Again, if you've been putting off cold storage for a while, look no further, this is the solution for you. You can visit the bitcoinlayer.com slash foundation and receive $10 off when you use promo code bitcoinlayer.